Ah, birthdays, don't you love them? <laughs> Doesn't really matter if we like them or not. Yeah, they're, they're, they're coming, they're coming. <sighs> All right, well, always a joy to see everybody. Uh, I guess most, most folks are in town for the Labor Day holiday, so that's a good, that's a good thing. Well, let's get started on Ephesians. Ephesians. Yeah, right. Book of Ephesians. That's right. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, let's open up with a word of prayer, asking for God's spirit to guide us. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for your son. We thank you that all glory is due him. We thank you that he came, he lived, he died, he rose again for us. We thank you so much that you have opened up our hearts and our eyes to see grace. We just pray that as we look at this portion today that you'd really stir our hearts as we look at this prayer that Paul prays for all saints. We just ask you to give us a clear vision of your love for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well... If you got the email, I uh, challenge you on this question. Blank changes everything. I know that can. <laughs> of course, there'll be someone in here that just shouts out, Jesus. Yeah, okay, okay, Jesus. <laughs> You'll be pretty safe with that answer. But in regards to these the two verses here in Ephesians 2.18 and Ephesians 3.12, what, what word would change everything? Let's look at those two verses here. Ephesians 2.18. If you got your Bible, better open it. Um, Ephesians 2.18. For through him, Christ, for through Christ, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. 3.12. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Well... Faith would be part of it, but in regards to those two answers, since I write the questions, my answer <laughs> would be access, access. I mean, Paul is writing to these Christians and trying to let them understand an amazing truth, is that God, the Creator, has made a way for you to come to Him. Remember, we've gone over the city of Ephesus. We've gone over the, these Gentiles. The only thing they were ever aware of was Artemis, the goddess of Artemis. And they would go to the temple, but they would not have a relationship with Artemis. There was no intimacy. There was no type of fellowship. It was just a false idol. That's all it was. And so for Paul to finally go through these first three chapters and explain to the Christians, they have access. They have fellowship. They have instant communion with the creator himself it, it, it is completely astounding to them unfortunately sometimes we get so familiar with it because we're just inundated uh, with so much religious truth religious teaching so to speak is that we can we can forget these real simple truths that just make so much difference in all of our lives but access really is changing everything and that we talked about that word last week prosago and what it means is it doesn't mean you just walk into the door the, the concept of that word is that you, you are ushered into the, it's a term like a royalty, you're ushered into the king. Someone brings you in special and lets you come right to the face of the king. It, it, it involves a face-to-face -face audience is what the word really means. And so for that part, it's pretty astounding that we have that kind of access to God that he's given us through his son. So the first three chapters of this book that Paul has given to us here, this, this letter that he's written, He's really revealing some powerful truth. I mean, Ephesians is one of those books where it's almost, it's almost a love letter, God writing to us, because Paul writes about things that in, he doesn't include in all of his other letters. Colossians would be the only one because Ephesians and Colossians are kind of mirror images of themselves. But he really includes that in Christ and through faith in him, we have full access to God the Father, so we can approach him with complete freedom and confidence. This is what was just... He, he wanted to bring this to the forefront of these Christians' hearts so they would know that they don't have to go to the temple. They don't have to go through. Remember, we talked about the conflict with the Jewish Christians, that they were upset because they didn't have to be circumcised. It's just that through faith alone in Christ, they could come and have access with the Father. And, I mean, even the Jews didn't have that kind of access. I mean, the high priest could only come once a year into the Holy of Holies. Other than that, I mean, that was it. There, there wasn't this freedom of uh, availability to reach out to God whenever we needed him. So for through Christ, 
we both have access to the Father by one spirit, and in verse 12, in Christ and through faith in him, we may enter God's presence with boldness and confidence. Um, so let's read through this portion here, and then we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to do something that's just a little bit different here, but let's go ahead and read through this portion. I've got it up on the screen, or you can look at it in the Bible. Uh, for this reason, we're in Ephesians 3, verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. <clears throat> that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Okay. Um, I think this is probably one of the most powerful passages in regards to a Christian's relationship with God. It's, it's so intimate. Paul is re referring to such deep truths here and yet such simple truths. I mean, he's, he's not writing theologians here. He's writing new Christians. He's writing Christians that have just come out of complete paganism, complete idol worship, and he's explaining to them about this relationship with God that we have. So what I wanted to do today, I actually have a whole series of slides that's going to go through, but I'm going to drop back and punt just a little bit. Part of it is because I, I promised you that a, a, I don't want to just go through this portion and check it off and then move on. What I wanted to do was go through it a lot more, um, maybe intimately, but this week has just been so crazy with everything I've been going on and Crystal's been going on, just work and pressures and stress and all kinds of crazy stuff. Nothing, nothing out of the ordinary, but just I, I honestly haven't had the time I need to just take more of this and let it ingrain in my own heart, to be honest with you. And I always promise you, I said, I won't come and just lay out a teaching for you. I could go through it. I'm close enough. But I just, I almost don't want to run through it that quick because I want this to just, I really want this to be part of my heart. I, I want this more and more in my life of what Paul's saying here. So what I wanted to do was just go through this slowly and we're going to have discussions on it because I don't know if you read this portion. Maybe you did read this portion. Maybe you studied it out. But honestly, it would do our spiritual life well to have this deeper into our hearts. Agreed? So, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. What reason? What reason is Paul referring to? Why can he, why can he say, for this reason, I kneel before the Father? What reason? Access. Huh? Access. Exactly. Because the verse right before that we just read, he said, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. So Paul is saying, look, because I can approach God, because I have freedom and access, just like you, I bow my knee. I kneel before the Father. Okay. So when we encounter a struggle or a battle, is the first thing that we do mentally, spiritually, is go to the Father, go to the Lord in prayer? Or do we go through a period of ranting and raving and screaming and upset and all this other stuff? Okay, I see you guys do that too. Okay. No, that's teenagers. Oh, that's teenagers, okay. <laughs> From whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. What does that mean? What does it mean that, that the entire family derives its name from the Father? What would that mean? Right. So that would be the angels and us. I'm thinking well, it could be the angels, but I'm I'm wondering. I'm thinking he's talking about the saints that have gone on before. Yeah. Is is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that's I the. I think it's the whole thing. Okay. Um, what does he mean when he says we derive our name from him? What does that mean? We were created in his image. We were created in his image. In his image. Okay. We're his children. Mm -hmm. Now, truly, we're children in the sense that he created us initially, but as believers, mm -hmm. 
we have something way more special, way more unique. Um, what is it? We have an inheritance form. In other words, okay, th think about your dad. You have his name. And, and what does that mean if you have your father's name? You have identity. You have identity. You have identity. You have inheritance. You have protection. I mean, you know, hopefully your dad is one who protects you. Um, now, again, this is sometimes people have, don't have a father like that. And that's why relating to God the Father in these type of terms and, and understandings can be very difficult for some people. But as fathers, that's the job we're supposed to communicate to children is that we're supposed to be reflecting the Father to him. But as children of God, that's, that's really what I think he's referring to here is that we are children of the Most High. We are children of God it's through adoption, which is, which is kind of strange. I mean, rebirth, but really it is, it's an adoption. Um, so he says... The reason I kneel is because I know I have full access to God. I can pour out my heart before him at any moment, with any crisis, with any praise, and I can come before him. All of us have received a name that we are sons and daughters of God. We're sons and daughters through the work Christ did. We've been adopted into the family of God. So because of that, he prays that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now that's a mouthful, but what's he mean? The according to the riches of his glory. What does that phrase mean, according to the riches of his glory? Well, according to the riches of his glory, how big is God's glory? Infinite. In infinite. infinite. So what Paul is saying, according to the riches of his glory, according to the infinite riches of God's glory. Well, that means there's no limit to the check I can write, so to speak. I mean, if he pays me out of his wallet, well, there's a limit to that. But if it's according to his riches, riches of his glory, there's no limit to God's glory. So therefore, there's no, there's no limit to the riches of how he can bless and strengthen and protect us. So that's when he says, according to the riches, according to what? According to the glory of his riches. There's no limit to God's glory. So therefore, because that there's no limit to what God's going to do, for us, then he starts to pray that he'd grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner being. Why would the Christians need that? Why would they need to be strengthened with power in their inner being? Because we walk by the spirit. Yeah. Makes us healthy spiritually. We need to be healthy spiritually. Remember who he's writing to? Of course, there's no difference really for us, but he's writing to a group of new believers that have lost all of their Gentile pagan friends. They're not calling them up on Friday night to go party at the temple. And the Jewish Christians are very, very resistant to them. And so he is praying that God would strengthen them with power. Anybody know what that word power is in the Greek? If I had a stick of dynamite and lit it, yeah, yeah. It's dunamos, and we get our English word dynamite from that. So what he's saying, I want you to be strengthened with the dunamos of God, with the power of God. In other words, the strength, the ability, the, 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 the power of God at work in your life. I, I want you to experience that, and I want you to be strengthened in your inner being. Why not my outer being? That's the flesh. Flesh doesn't matter. I mean, yes, it's important to take care of your bodies because if the body breaks down, you're going to have a hard time with a few other things. But he wants us strengthened in our spirit. He wants us strengthened in our inner being. In other words, where you are in your inner self, that's where God wants to have that fellowship with you. So he prays, according riches of your glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being in order so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. What does he mean by that? That Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith. We're totally surrendered to Christ. Totally surrendered to Christ? Good. The Holy Spirit dwelling in you? The Holy Spirit? Because it's interesting, you, in some of these verses here, Paul is re referencing the entire Godhead, the Father through the Spirit for the glory of Christ. I mean, the, the Godhead is so intimately involved that sometimes you can't even separate the work that's being done. But he is saying here he wants God's spirit to be strengthening us because God's spirit is truly the spirit that lives in us. It, you know, Jesus Christ doesn't live in my heart 
technically, because we have the comforter, we have the spirit of, of God. Okay. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I guess when I read that, it's like, I want it to be an ongoing relationship. I, I want it to be a deepening relationship. I want my life so I can look back a week, a year, decade, and just say, I see my life dwelling more with Christ. I see a growth. I see a difference. I see a depth. I have a note, Michael, on the Jump in. Um, part that says to be at home then. So that makes me think that he, he wants us at a place in our lives, spiritually, <clears throat> relationally, whatever it is, all of it, where we never, like, he's always welcome. Mm -hmm. There's never a time when we go, mm -hmm. I don't want me to come here. That's good. Like, even, even in our sin, there's always that welcomeness that he's there. Right. Because that's where he wants to be. No, that's good. Because sometimes we have a tendency to have a little special room that we don't want God to enter into. It's that little closet that is all ours, and that's... He knows all about it. He knows all about it. <laughs> <laughs> he does? <laughs> After all, God found Adam and Eve. Yeah. Right? That's right. He tracked them down. Just don't put a door on it, you know. No, that's good. I th thanks for sharing that. Okay that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, if actually when you take this apart, there's actually four requests or four petitions here that, that Paul is actually praying. Um, now he goes to the next one. And I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love. Why do you say love? Why not rooted and grounded in wisdom? Yeah, wisdom, that's good. How about rooted and grounded in peace? That's, that's good. Rooted and grounded in humility. Ooh, that's even better. Why, why focus in rooted and grounded in love? Because that's God. That's God? That's who he is. Yeah. Who else? Someone else. Why love? Well, if you've got love, you've got all the other stuff. Right. Love is the foundation. Love is the foundation. I think the implication is Christ's love, God's love. Yeah, absolutely. Doesn't the love get us away from ourselves and focus on others? Right. I think Paul is saying, I never got over the realization of what Christ did for me because that was ultimate love. To give himself for my sin, that was, a, that was the, the demonstration of love. For God so loved the world that he gave. And so that is the, that's the thing that Paul never got over, and he, does, and he wants these Christians to never get over it too. But something's going to happen in Ephesus, and it's going to get very, very sad. I mean, here you have the Apostle Paul writing this letter, praying that these Christians would be rooted and grounded in love. That, and I think we can surmise that what he wants is that each and every believer to have an intimate, growing relationship with Christ. They spend time in the Word. They obey the Word, because Jesus said in John, if you love me, obey my commandments. If you say you and God are having a good relationship, but yet you're living a life that's completely breaking every commandment he gives, it's like that is not a real relationship because Jesus wants us to obey. We demonstrate our love. So this Ephesians church, Paul has just encouraged them to have this growing, deepening relationship with Jesus. And yet what, what's going to happen in about 40 years? Flip over to Revelation. Gonna get another letter. <laughs> Gonna get another letter. <laughs> oh, Mr. Postman. <laughs> Flip over to chapter two and look at the letter that Jesus writes to them. So here's Paul. Look, grow in your relationship with Christ. Be rooted and grounded in love. Com comprehend what what Christ has done for you. Don't ever forget that. And then. Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 to the angel at the church in Ephesus write these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands I know your deeds your hard work your perseverance I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false you have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary I mean, that's a really, I'd like to get that letter from the Lord. You know, I mean, that, 
everyone would hang that one up on the refrigerator and frame it. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Oh, dagger to the heart. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has a hear, ear, let him hear what I, the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So Paul is writing them and stressing to them in this letter, don't lose that intimate love relationship. Don't let your Christian life become something you do on Wednesdays, you do on Sundays, and maybe a couple special times of the year you do it. Don't let it, don't let it become a routine. I mean, if, if you're married and it turns into a routine, that's going to get pretty dry pretty quick. Don't let that relationship become routine. Anyone else? Move forward, don't go back. Move forward. And I think that's what they were saying. You started falling back in the old ways, and you incorporated it in the new ways. Isn't that what they're saying? In a matter of speaking, they, they yeah. mixed up God's Word with some of the old stuff, too. Well, what happened to the church? Love, love, the love of God needs to be the engine, the motivating power behind what you're doing. That's right. So if you're doing it because you're trying to check off your to-do list. That's right. Or any other reason it's the wrong motive and the Lord's after that love of him to be what drives you excellent I mean Paul said in the, in the in Corinthians for the love of Christ constrains me the love of Christ constrains me amen yeah I mean won't we be even more astounded when we when we are in heaven and we see what he's done for us a lot more clearly now we can see that with the eyes of faith i mean it's it's there in the word but sometimes we live in such a visual world that unless we see it it doesn't completely connect with us but when you see the wicked judged and cast into the lake of fire when you see satan and his angels burning in the eternal fire of brimstone it's going to be a whole lot more real because we're going to realize that that actually could have been me if grace hadn't intervened, if love hadn't tracked me down and won. Then he says, I pray you being rooted and grounded in love may have power, once again, dunamis, together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Why, why does he include that portion together with all the saints? Why does he say that? Yeah, unity. That's an honor. I mean, it, it's to be part of the body. And again, Paul's, Paul's bringing this concept back, the body, the body. We're a body of Christ. We're that spiritual temple that's being built, not with bricks and mortar and stone, but with people, with people. And there's, there's Love one another, absolutely. There's also a uh, kind of a collection of... Uh, a collection of what the saints in the past have comprehended. There's a, there's a record of that mm -hmm. in the Word of God and, and elsewhere too, but particularly in the Word of God. And, and we we get to uh, be privy to that <coughs> and and help use that um, to bolster our faith. And, yeah. and so we're, we're really joining um, a, um, a heritage of faith. That's true. Yeah. But it's not just for us. It's for us to know and then witness to others. That's right. You, if you don't get that, you can't. No. Well, you, you'll be witnessing a dead saying. religion. You know, mm -hmm. if, if it's not motivated by love, it just won't be effective. I mean, who wants to join a, a, a dead religion? I mean, we, we have a living Savior that loves us, and this is what Paul was trying to do. And the thing about with, together with all the saints, it's like, I can't make it on my own. I mean, we're, you know, the, the Lone Ranger Christian model is, is not going to make it. And that's why you've got to be part of a body. You've got to be part of a, a, a smaller group. You've got to be with people that can, you know, in a moment's notice, pick up the phone and call for help. I mean, without it, it, it just, you, you, you won't make it. I wouldn't make it. Michael, going back to the word access. Yes. Is that, he was, so Paul was talking to this new group who felt isolated. 
Right. And he wanted them to know that they weren't isolated because people before you <clears throat> and present and future are with you. That's in good. The realm of Christ, in the realm yeah, of that's right. In, in Christ. But also, it, that speaks to every person throughout time because the access is for every person. It transcends every every generation. People. Mm -hmm. It transcends every position you're in in your culture. Whether you're rich, poor, downtrodden, a slave. Uh, that's good. Paul talks about that all the time. Right. He wrote about that all the time. And I think that's the thing that every person can grasp is that I have access. I don't have to have someone who's over me. I don't. The, the power structure of the church, I mean, Christ blew that all away. Yeah. That was the whole point of it, was to blow that away. And we still try to bring that back. Mm -hmm. um, you're right. But we don't have to have that. Like, it doesn't work that way. We don't have to choose that anymore. No, I think that's excellent because that, that that's that's so good. Because again, they were the, they were used to the priest and priestesses at the Temple of Artemis. To think you could just walk in and ha get access to Artemis would, would be they wouldn't even think of that. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to break that all down, and then of course, like you said, religions today they they always kind of go back to this. There's there's someone in between you and God. There's no one in between you and God except Christ Jesus. I mean, he, he is our mediator. We don't need any other person. That's uh, why we kneel. That's right. Stop the way. That's right. I, I Johnny? think about talking about the ground of love and, and the wide and, and the long, high and deep is that when you think about God's love for us and you know, we talk about grace, but then I know in times of my life and other people's lives, it's like, well, well, where did God go? You know, the lions and he's helping the lions and doing this. It's God hasn't, or Jesus and the Holy Spirit haven't gone anywhere. Yeah. You're the one that's moved. You know, you talked about your little secret room or right. whatever. You know, that's the part, and I think grounded in love and, and having that two way relationship. And I, and I can't imagine, you know, these these people coming from Artemis to you know, all this paganism to now, I have this, you know, this is, this is not possible. You know? That's right. I can't imagine. <laughs> I think that's the thing when I think about this is you move, God does it. Hmm. That's, that's good. And he, when he talks about how wide and long and high and deep, I mean, in my mind, he's going in every single dimension possible, meaning that we will never fully comprehend the love that God has had for us to provide his son as our sacrifice. And, and if I would ever <clears throat> comprehend it, then there's something wrong. I mean, God is unfathomable. There's no way you're going to understand all of what he has done Until for us. Over. Well, even then, we're still not going to. Are you sure? Absolutely. <laughs> well, we will get to see him as he is, but we will be forever learning. I'll be forever, ever. Yeah. Next part, to know the love that surpasses knowledge. To know the love that surpasses knowledge? How does that, how does that work? Is it just a feeling-based thing? What's he mean by that? Well, you got to read the next part. So that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. I mean, if the Gentile Christians read that, to th I'm thinking, they're thinking that God wants to fully indwell me, and literally, I'm going to radiate God to other people. And, and that's, that's really what we've been given. It's not that we become God. It's that we are made in the image and likeness of God. We are able to reflect God. We're able to show other people God by our actions. I mean, we can show people God or we can show people Satan. You know, when the person cuts you off in front on the highway, you know, is it, is it God reflecting or is it someone else? <laughs> Oh, that's your horn dog. Yeah. Well, I know sometimes I, I, I don't demonstrate God as quick as I want. Mom? Yeah, I don't know if this relates exactly, but I like to stretch points. Um, I used to always wonder, like, what was the big deal about, you know, sacrificing life, a life, mm -hmm. you know? And why, why did God come up with that in the first place? That's you know, good. Why not just... And then I, I, it finally occurred to me, and this is really reiterating that point, is that, like, the willingness to pass it, it 
from this life into the next life show is an extreme is the ultimate uh, expression of faith in God. To, to be mm -hmm. able to, for that to know that you're going to pass into that next place, you know. And you're right. Heaven. So it, it, once I realized that, it kind of like a lot of the other stuff kind of fell into place as to why Christ had to had to give up his life, why you know why all this you know why they were sacrificing lambs and bulls mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Because it's, it's a demonstration of ultimate faith in God and in Christ that we're going to exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's a very good, very good point. And the reason there has to be a sacrifice is because of God's attribute of justice and holiness. The problem is, is that it's not like you're paying for your sin. It's that you have to to die the soul that sins must die so in god's universe which is the only universe there is if a creature rebels or sins the payment because of god's justice and holiness is death well that was what the animals were for is that to reflect my justice and holiness i want you to understand you have to die for your sins there's no other way out of this equation you will die unless there is a substitutionary atonement, and that's what God has designed and allowed. There could be a, a substitute. The lambs and the bulls, they were temporary substitutes because they could never take away a person's sin, but because that person's faith would look towards the ultimate sacrifice coming, they could. And so that, because I thought the same question, why all the sacrificing of animals? Then I realized it all goes back to God's love. He loves us so much that he gave us the sacrifice of his son. It's the only way my sins could be atoned for. And an infinite, sinless person would have to die, and my sins were placed on him on a, in an atoning way, and by faith my confidence is in that, and that's it. I mean, it's it's beautifully simple, but it's eternally that's complex. Why you say it didn't make any sense to be a Exactly. Well, his son. Exactly. His son. No, that's that's so good, Rob. That's so good because it does it doesn't make sense unless you have spiritual life. Then it makes perfect sense. And it's not just any of sacrifice. It's the best of the best. That's right. Yeah. But, but bottom line is, it's not so much the animals as the blood that covers our sin. Uh, true. True, because the blood was the symbol of life, so the spilling of blood was the symbol of, of, of death. You're right. No, 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 no. Well, you, no, you're right, because that, that's why the emphasis was on the blood, is because the blood symbolized the life given. Exactly. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. You know, Early on, I read that verse, and I thought, wow, that's kind of like one of those lottery verses, you know. You can kind of just ask whatever you want, and God's going to do more than what you even ask. And as I was reading through all this, I'm thinking, I don't think that's the context of this verse at all. I mean, it's, a, it's applicable to situations in life, but I think what Paul is saying is, for him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly in my life to draw me into this deeper relationship with Christ. That's what I think this verse is talking about. What do you I think? I think that also covers that, you know, when things happen and we're like, what is the purpose of this in my life? Those, that's that unknown thing that we don't know here. Yeah. We may never know here, but we always seek for that answer, don't we? So I think yeah, that's good. that abundantly beyond our knowledge is that's God's one of those omni- all of those right. Presence, his, right. You know, everything about him. And that's where it takes faith. Know. And that's where we have to have faith to just that's right. accept and be willing to be used by him. And and that can be really <laughs> tough. <laughs> that can be hard. Very hard. Because we don't see how it we don't see how that piece fits into our puzzle. Mm -hmm. And it's like God is saying, It's not your puzzle piece to worry about. I'll I'll take care of it. You know, but Lord, it's cancer, or but it's a death, or but it's it's whatever crisis, and it's like there's a reason, 
but you're not going to understand it at this point. Can, can you trust me? You know, that's why we, we, a few weeks ago we said God is, God is going to receive all the glory and everything he does is good. And if I believe those two things, then a whole lot of worry can be set aside if I believe that God is going to receive all the glory and that it's ultimately for my good. Michael, what I see it in each of these verses is there's a fleshly part of it and a spiritual side of it. I've been marking in each one. I see that there's a, a measure of width and height, and that's kind of something that we can grasp. Mm-hmm. And then there's surpasses knowledge. Knowledge is kind of a fleshly thing. Mm-hmm. And then exceedingly abundant, all that we can ask or think, that we can, in our flesh, can ask or think. All of those point back to but God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Each one of those words good. keep expanding that vision to the point where you can't grasp it. So how can you put God into Wednesday and Sunday morning if he's that? Yeah. Well, Paul wraps up. Oh, go ahead. Well, I would just say, you know, I love reading missionary books and um, their lives because uh, as I, when you first started the lesson and you were doing those verses, and I just thought, you know, this is this is the reality that we want to live in. Mm-hmm. Right? You start out with just the words, and then you start breaking it down, and then God enables us through our lives to it becomes real. I mean, the real, and I was. That's right. Down, I write down quotes that I am so impressed with, and like Corey Tim Boone mm-hmm. said, when all the exterior things are stripped away, then the love of Christ is all that remains. Wow. Learning to forgive. I mean, and I just love that concept because that's what God is doing in all our lives. In yeah. Fashion. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Thank we you for. Stripped away, but, and all that's left is up here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's excellent, Wayne. We need to fully understand this for the days that we're facing ahead. I agree. We're going to have to stand up soon and declare Christ as Lord. Absolutely. For I, I, you better have that. I wouldn't faith doubt in that. Your heart, or you won't be able to do that. And that's why Paul is going to stress in the next three chapters about work this out. Okay, here's the truth. Now work it out in your daily life. Here's the areas you need to work it through. And then he finally ends, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. And remember we talked about that a couple weeks ago, is that somehow, very uniquely in God's mind, he is demonstrating his wisdom and all of his other attributes to the rebel angels, to, to the guard, fallen guardian cherub. He's displaying his wisdom through us, the church. And it's like, I don't know how that all works, Lord. But that's pretty amazing is that you're going to show glory through our broken lives as you redeem us and sanctify us, and it's going to be forever and ever and ever. I mean, you're right. This is what we have truly ahead of us, and I just don't want, I don't want to end up like the church at Ephesus where I'm doing all the right stuff, but my heart starts to drift. My, my passion for what Christ has done for me on the cross starts to wane. I don't want that. Of course, the sad thing is you don't really know it's waning if you worry about it. So anyways, um, I, I, just, I just wanted to take a little time just to kind of go through this a little slower. We'll dig it out and flush it out a little bit more next week. But I would challenge you to, to work on memorizing this portion. I mean, it's just a few short verses. But I got to tell you, these verses here just encapsulate what God wants you to experience in his son Christ. Well, thank you all for participating and sharing today. I truly appreciate that. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life in the body. Thank you for each person here. We ask you to just make these these truths more real in our lives so that we would walk as Christ would walk and shine a light to those that are still lost in darkness. All for your glory. Amen. Amen.